Gunboat Diplomacy is a diplomacy variant played in the exact same way you play standard diplomacy, except that players are not allowed to talk to one another. At first glance, that seems to remove the core element of the game, negotiation. However, in reality, it really doesn't. The game's mechanics stay the same, so it's still much easier to progress with assistance than it is by yourself and someone who manages to make an alliance is heavily advantaged against anyone who doesn't. Good gunboat players use their orders to communicate, pitching alliances and trying to signal intent through their movements and supports. A simple example. The very direction you send your units can tell the other players who you're looking to attack. If you move into the English Channel in, as England in spring 1901, you're putting pressure on the French home centre of Brest, and hampering French expansion into Iberia as a result, sending a pretty clear signal to the rest of the board that you intend to attack France. By doing this, you're implicitly pitching an alliance to Germany as well, because to attack France effectively as England, you need Germany's help. You can also throw out more specific signals. For example, say you're England and you open to North Sea instead, with France entering Burgundy and Germany entering Ruhr. Both France and Germany can make a move on Belgium here, so you can signal your alliance intent by supporting the move of the player you want to align yourself with. Now, it's possible that your chosen ally doesn't actually make that move. For example, Germany might want to move Ruhr back to Munich here to cover. Or France might attack Munich instead of Belgium. But that doesn't actually really matter. Your support isn't as much about impacting the board right now as it is about sending a clear message of your intentions going forward. It's a signaling move. You can even use these signaling moves to communicate with someone you're already working with. For example, throwing a support move at a given province tells your ally that's a move you want them to make. It doesn't matter if your support doesn't work because your ally does something else on that turn, it still sets you up for the future by communicating your intent. Some adjudicators allow for all sorts of invalid moves, and on these, communication and intents are pretty easy to convey. For example, in face-to-face -face gunboat play, where you just write your orders down on paper, ordering a unit to convoy another player's unit to Switzerland is a commonly accepted method of proposing a truce. However, the adjudicator we're talking about in this video, Web Diplomacy, limits the orders you can enter to just those which could be valid. For example, you can only issue supports for moves that the unit you're supporting can actually make, and where the support you're giving would be valid. So, no supporting Eastern Mediterranean to Barents, since that's not a valid move, or telling Army Munich to support Constantinople to Bulgaria, since that's not a move Munich can support. In this context, your ability to signal is much more limited, and therefore you need to be more clever in how you set your signals up and where you use them. So that's a brief introduction to gunboat diplomacy. Why am I talking about gunboat diplomacy at all? Well, between January and March of this year, I played about 60 gunboat games in a tournament on web diplomacy. If you're a diplomacy aficionado, then that number probably has already raised an eyebrow for you, given that even expert players don't tend to play more than 50 diplomacy games or so in a year. In fact, this two and a half month period represents over 10% of the games I've played in the 12 years since I discovered this game in the first place. Why did I play so many? Well, this was no ordinary gunboat tournament. This was Meta's speedboat tournament. This tournament wasn't entirely against humans. While we didn't know which player it would be, we always knew that one of the seven players in each game would be an AI, with the purpose of the whole tournament being to test AIs against humans in an environment where humans define the meta. Let me explain why humans defining the meta is so important in diplomacy. As a seven-player game where you need to coordinate with at least some of your opponents, the expectations your opponents have for the game play a huge part in the way you have to play. For example, if you're one human playing on a board with six bots, even though those six bots aren't necessarily working together from the outset, you still have to adapt your playstyle to fit theirs. 
if your signaling can't be interpreted by the bots, you won't find any allies, and you'll go down, assuming they're at least reasonably competent. Most diplomacy AIs are tested in this one human versus six bots context, or purely against other AIs, but a bot that's strong in that context is by no means guaranteed to be strong when the tables are turned. Take one of the bots meta tested, Dora. Dora did very, very well in purely bot games, but extremely badly in games versus six humans. The reason for this was that it made moves that just didn't make sense to a human. An example of this was issuing supports for other players into its own home supply centers to pitch an alliance. Other Dora bots recognized this as an alliance signal and would start working with the bots, but a human would never signal an alliance like this, and as such, humans would often just take that as an invitation to take its centers, wiping it off the map as both its enemies and its attempted friends carved it up between them. For a diplomacy AI to truly prove itself, it would need to demonstrate its ability in a human-dominated meta, and this tournament, its purpose was to test exactly that. Four different AIs were tested in this tournament, the aforementioned Dora, one called BRBot, and two variants of Meta's new AI, Diplodocus. Dora and BRBot were not great, but Diplodocus, man. Diplodocus blew me away. But before I give you the specifics on that, allow me one more tangent as I explain what I think is key to a gunboat AI doing well. Here are, in my opinion, the five keys of gunboat diplomacy for an AI, and to some extent for humans as well. The first is very simple. To be a great AI, a bot needs to have a solid grasp of diplomacy tactics in general. If it's placed in an advantageous one versus one situation, which obviously most of the time you aren't, but <laughs> let's say it was, it should win almost every time. Diplomacy has some guessing games in its tactics, so it won't be an always thing, but a bot should be on level with the best human players in terms of choosing the best moves in a one versus one. The second makes things a bit more complicated. An AI should have the ability to coordinate with a human player it's already aligned with, predicting their moves, entering supports and moves that are likely to match theirs, and in general being able to push the front forward together. Cooperation like this is critical for making good progress. Diplomacy tends to favor the defender, so you can rarely advance without help if you're on even footing. The third is where that alliance comes from in the first place. An AI needs to be able to signal its intent, both in the context of making alliances and in the context of telling its ally what it wants to do where that might be unclear. As we saw with Dora, it's not enough to be able to signal this to other bots. It needs to be able to do it in a way that can be easily understood by human players. Not just that, it needs to comprehend where its signals are likely to be convincing and where they aren't, and prioritize making pitches where the prospective ally is likely to accept. The fourth is where Dipnet, the AI which powers web diplomacy's inbuilt play against AI function, ends up falling a bit flat, as it's notorious for sticking to its alliances for too long. An AI needs to have a good understanding of when it's in its best interest to work with another player and when it's in its best interest to work against them. It's all well and good conquering the board alongside an ally, but if you go into the endgame with less power than they have, then doing so was a mistake. You're going to lose to them. The best diplomacy players are constantly assessing their alliances, making sure they're likely to come out on top in the long run, and being ready to switch things up if they're not. And finally, the fifth and final key to a strong gunboat AI is the ability to seem human. Why is this important? Well, let's assume an AI masters all four of the others and becomes superhuman, winning game after game after game. Said AI probably becomes famous in the diplomacy community, but that's not a good thing for it. Players recognize that the AI's skill is a danger to them, which suddenly makes the AI a terrible ally to have. 
It will never leave itself open to a good stab, it will never let you have the upper hand, and you will lose to it in late game. So players just won't ally with it, and in fact they'll try and wipe it off the map as soon as they can, something which can be successfully done every single time in diplomacy if enough players are on board. How do you negate that? Well, one solution is just to make the AI artificially weaker, so that players view it as less of a threat overall, and are less inclined to gang up on it and kill it. But that's obviously not ideal if your whole project is to make a strong diplomacy AI, so what else is there? The other solution, if the AI is playing anonymously, and that part is important, is to blend in with the humans so that the humans don't know who to target. If it's not obvious who this superhuman AI is from the outset, other players are likely to play to increase their own strength rather than to take this AI out, and they may well align with the AI player in the process. Once it's through the early game and powered up, it can then show off its strength without worry of being ganged up on and eliminated. So in my opinion, those are the five keys. Tactics, cooperation, persuasion, self-interest, and imitation. In that context, let's look at Diplodocus. So, I originally wanted to make a commentary series going through every game I played in Meta's tournaments. In fact, we actually did start this getting four games in. That's the Battle for Humanity series. But it ultimately proved to be infeasible just time-wise, and some stuff cropped up that stopped our work on it. I'm still hoping to finish it at some point, and the reason for that is that I really wanted viewers to experience these games like I did, both improving my own play as I went along, something that playing 60 games in a very short period was very good for, but also, importantly, figuring out more and more about the bot game by game. The first AI, Diplodocus Low, surprised everyone with how strong it could be. It had a solid mastery of the first four of my keys. It was exceptionally strong tactically, especially when it got an SC lead. It could cooperate, it could signal, and it could stab. Oh boy, could it stab. <laughs> I saw player after player get decimated by this AI after aligning themselves with it. But in my mind at least, it didn't achieve the fifth. Diplodocus Low was very stabby indeed. It would attack its ally much earlier than you would expect a human to, and it would fight on multiple fronts at the same time, many more than any human would be comfortable with. It didn't mind irritating multiple neighbours if it thought it could outmaneuver them all, something it often managed, but which made it fairly easy to spot among a board of more conservative and more alliance-focused human players. Now, I was jostling with Diplodocus Low for the top spot in the tournament for pretty much the entire time it was playing, and as the tournament developed, I adapted my playstyle specifically to counter it. I'm always a bit of a paranoid player, but seeing this bot and what it could do raised that to the max. I would play a very defensive game early on, not giving anyone an opening, even if this defensive playstyle hampered my own expansion. I would then try to identify the bot, and once I spotted it, I would adapt my play accordingly. If I was allied to a human, I would often open up a little bit more to advance more quickly. If I found myself aligned with the bot, I would keep a solid defensive line against it, even if I kept working with it, and play a slower game, looking to stab if it left itself open. Now, that may sound mean of me to target the bot like that, but it was completely justified in my opinion. This AI was good, and if I played an alliance with it like I would with a human player, I would basically never come out on top. By doing this, I was able to stay relatively even with it on tournament score right up until it ended its test game run on the game number 50. And then came Diplodocus High. I was still paranoia-induced from the previous bot's run, so I tried to continue the same general strategy, but I could not. Diplodocus High played a completely different type of game to Diplodocus Low, sticking with its alliances for longer and just generally playing more like a human would. It still had a few tells, particularly how much it's valued Scandinavia, uh, we'll get to that in a bit, but in general, I couldn't use my bot countering playstyle simply because most of the time I couldn't tell which power this AI was playing. 
As I told the researchers at the time, the most effective way I found to figure that out was just to look back and see who had played the best game. But by the time you could do that, it was usually far too late to stop the bot rolling. Diplodocus High was incredible. It repeatedly got very, very strong results, eventually going on to completely crush me and every other human in the final standings. But there were two instances in particular where it completely blew me away. They weren't its best games, I want to reiterate that, it had far more dominant games than either of these, but they were the two games that left a lasting impression on me. Let's take a look at the first. In this game, I'm playing as England. I go to North Sea and support Germany into Belgium, intending to align with them against France and Russia. They do take my support, but immediately afterwards, they build two fleets. This was one of the rare occasions where I spotted Diplodocus High early on. Remember that I mentioned it liking Scandinavia? That was a pattern I noticed. As Germany, both Diplodocus bots would often attempt to gain control of all of Denmark, Sweden, and Norway right off the bat, prioritizing that while keeping a minimal defensive force on its French border. The French player would often take that as an alliance pitch and would work with the German bot, but the strength with which Germany immediately committed to Scandinavia, combined with the fact that England would usually focus on defending their homeland, meant that France would often get completely outpaced in that alliance and Germany would become the sole dominant power in the North and West. I'd seen this happen in plenty of games before this. Two fleets would have already set off alarm bells because that's already committing far more to Scandinavia than most humans would at this stage. Doing so after being supported to Belgium by England? That has to be the boss. It was basically rejecting my alliance and going all out pitching one to France during the build phase. But what could I do? I wasn't in the power position here. I'd just declared my intention to go against France and Germany had pulled the rug out from under me by offering France an alliance instead. What France would choose me as an ally in that situation? Add in that Russia hadn't even made it into Sweden, they misordered in the fall and sent their units to Finland instead, and I was looking very short of potential allies. So I decided to make a very risky play. The bot Scandinavian strategy usually worked because it would outpace France due to England defending their homeland. But what if England didn't defend their homeland at all? France would be powered up and would have the clear upper hand in the alliance, something the bot surely wouldn't accept. So that's the gambit I took. I used every unit I had to push into Scandinavia, keeping Germany out of Sweden and entering Skagerrak in fall 1902 by basically abandoning London, Liverpool and Edinburgh entirely. I was sending a very clear message. I don't care how strong France gets, you're not getting this. And it worked. The bots stabbed France in spring 1903, sneaking behind their lines in Picardy and attempting to encircle Burgundy. However, it didn't stop attacking me at the same time. It tried to do both at once. Maybe thinking, kind of reasonably given I'd kind of given up all of my home centers, that I would lose enough units from the French attack that I wouldn't be able to contest Scandinavia anymore. In fall 1903, I did finally manage to get into Sweden, having three fleets and three centres, Edinburgh, Norway, and Sweden. France was in the North Sea, so Edinburgh was obviously already lost. So in order to maintain my three fleets, I needed one more centre, something I decided to try and take from the German. I entered Sweden to Denmark with support from Skagerrak. And on this phase... The bot in Germany decides to leave me alone completely. They attack North Sea with Denmark and they pull Baltic back to defend Kiel, not bothering to defend Denmark against my rather obvious attack. They now have a retreat to consider. Does Denmark retreat to Baltic in vengeance? Or do they go to Heligoland Bight, giving them the potential to push on the North Sea with me? What do you think they do here? This was the move that shocked me. F. Den. Disband. 
Despite both retreats having substantial advantages, Baltic Sea giving them the ability to contest Denmark or Sweden, Heligland giving them power on the North Sea, and potential to sneak attack into Denmark, and in fact both of them giving them the better potential to defend their homeland against the French and Austrian units, the AI decides to forego both and play a unit down during the fall phase. Why did it do this? Well, sometimes players disband the unit so that they can rebuild it, but in order to do that, the AI would need to maintain its center count, which means taking a center to replace Denmark, which is a far-fetched prospect at this point. Even if they manage that, the Austrian has just run up to the German border, making it very unlikely that the German hope centers can even be kept open for builds without being invaded. The only reason that really makes sense to me is that the AI thought that A, it was necessary to get England on side, and B, this was the only way to do it. Thus far this game, I'd gone all out against Germany to a ridiculous degree, a degree that a strong diplomacy player would look at and say, that player is just suiciding. Despite a retreat to Helgoland being friendlier than a retreat to Baltic, it still has the potential to threaten Denmark, the bot decided here that it needed to send the strongest possible signal it could send to me, and gave up significant power on the board to do so. Now, ultimately this game doesn't work out well for either myself or the bot. We fight side by side against the French for quite some time, even making some progress, before the bot panics me by moving to Baltic and makes me retreat back into Scandinavia again. We make up there and start coordinating again, and the bot actually manages to successfully predict what attack France will use in spring 1908, entering the only supports that will counter it, but I fail to make the same prediction, so we lose Holland. From there, it's just a matter of time before we guess wrong again and France rolls us. I'd powered France up so much that they were basically unbeatable without Italian assistance here, and Italian assistance came far too late. The final result of the game didn't detract from how impressed I was by the bots here. It had a solid strategy to start the game, it was thrown in an extremely unusual situation that countered that strategy. It correctly assessed that it was going to get outpaced, it made the stab it needed to, and when it was clear that things still weren't going its way, it deliberately took a drastic action in weakening itself specifically to convey its alliance intention to me, and in doing so successfully convinced me to side with it. I know plenty of human players who would not have been able to handle this situation as well as Diplodocus High did. So we've seen an example of myself spotting the bot and deliberately playing against it. That game was an exception to the rule. In the vast majority of games, I only knew which power Diplodocus I was playing, either when the game ended or when they became strong enough that it was too late to stop them. The second example of when it blew my mind was one of the latter, one of the vast majority. I played Austria in this game and I opened as I usually do as Austria, bouncing Galicia and entering Serbia and Albania. My general strategy in these games was to play defensively, but there's a limit to that, and Austria is one of those powers where a completely defensive opening, like the Hedgehog, will hamper your growth so much that you very likely die immediately afterwards anyway, particularly since you don't signal an alliance to anyone by doing that. In making the moves I did, I left Trieste open, and annoyingly, the Italian moved in behind me. <laughs> However, the Italian did not move the other army up to follow, meaning that this would be a rather terrible attack if it was meant to be one. Only one centre could be taken, and that centre couldn't even be effectively held beyond that year. This is a pretty common approach in high-level gunboat when Italy wants to either gain a fifth centre or gain a replacement centre for Tunis so that they can go for Aegean early, but they don't want to annoy Austria in doing so. Moving in with only one unit makes it clear that the attack is not really an attack, just a request to borrow the centre. As such, I move away to take Greece. I can't really retake Trieste anyway, because doing so would just push the unit into Budapest, so I'm going to let it go and see what the Italian does with it. 
They do not fast track their attack into Turkey, they still convoy over to take Tunis, but they do throw a support hold on Serbia, a gesture which further cements that that army is not there to attack me. Something else happens that phase. Russia enters Romania with a fleet, which is an absolute godsend to me because a fleet can't participate in any kind of attack on me. By putting the fleet there, Russia has declared that they're siding with me on this front, which immediately has me thinking, well, now I have the leeway to turn around and oust that Italian army. It's quite common for Austrian players to let the Italian units stay, but my heightened paranoia at this stage in the tournament had me very much wanting to get rid of it. But then come builds, and two Italian fleets. Two Italian fleets after taking Trieste is extremely pro-Austrian. The Italian player is doubling down on not being able to be any kind of further threat to the Austrian by not placing any army that could attack Austria. What's more, Russia doesn't build anything in the south. They failed to take Sweden, and they decided to use their build to hold their northern front rather than placing a unit in Sevastopol. This means they're basically projecting no power over Turkey, and will be entirely unable to help me in any war on that front. Going into the spring, looking at that situation, what would you do in my spot here? Russia is basically a non-factor in the south, meaning I'm in a power triangle with Italy and Turkey. Despite sniping Trieste, Italy has made it exceptionally clear that they intend to work with me, and has deliberately hamstrung their ability to attack me in doing so. I could take Trieste back, but that would very likely annoy the Italian, and I would have to play an Austria-Turkey alliance with a very strong Turkey. Not even mentioning that I would have to convince Turkey that that's better for them than the Italy-Turkey that Italy would then come for. Despite all of this, I would 100% have kicked Italy out of Trieste had they not done this in exactly the way they did. If they moved their Roman army north at any point, I would have been afraid of an attack and would have thrown everything at them. If they'd built a second army in the north, I would have been extremely unhappy with the power that they were projecting over me, not even to mention the fact that they would have been using the tree build in a way that was aggressive towards me, something I would not have been happy with I was, given I was essentially being asked to let them borrow it. So I again would have kicked them out. And finally, if I had known Italy was the boss, which it was, by the way, I would have kicked them out in a heartbeat, everything else aside. But I didn't. In fact, at this point I was fairly certain Italy wasn't the bot. I couldn't see the bot doing something like this. The whole way this opening works is just so negotiation focused that it feels like it would be beyond a bot's comprehension. And that certainty, that Italy was a human, finalized my decision. I'd stick with them for this year and push for Bulgaria and Romania, solidifying my position and weakening the Turk, before then turning around and taking Trieste back. My thinking was once I'd done that, even if Italy was annoyed by the kickout, they would have committed enough against Turkey that they wouldn't have any good alliance option against me. Even if they did commit against me at that point, I would have enough of an army presence and they would have too much of a fleet presence that I would be able to hold the majority of my lands. And so I did that. I pushed Italy against the Turks, supporting them into the Aegean Sea. I also forced my way into Galicia, positioning around Romania in a way that meant I'd be very likely to take it in the fall. Italy threw a support hold on Budapest, another alliance signal, and moved in all the ways you would expect a Lepanto alliance to. And then the fall came. And my fall came. Just as I was about to solidify my position and make myself unstabable, the bot makes a brutal stab, taking advantage of the trust it's instilled in me to walk into the center I've left open, Vienna, and pushing me out of Greece at the same time, pivoting in an almost unbelievably effective way from a strong AI alliance to a position where it had all the power. The rest of this game is really just tactics, although the bot's tactics are pretty much flawless. I get a bit lucky with Turkey choosing to prop me up rather than just work with Italy to dismantle me, 
<laughs> but I still get decimated by a strong 1904 maneuver by the bot, in which they let me take Venice in order to basically wipe me out everywhere else. Take a look through this game's tactics if you want to, in particular the way it uses self-bounces are a masterclass. Ultimately, this game left me shocked. In the 60-ish games I played in this tournament, I was only eliminated in 6, and that was for good reason, I never let my guard down. I did poorly in a fair few of the games, usually as a result of being on the outside of the Dominance Alliance and having to defend myself, but they were usually a long, slow grind. And even on the occasion where someone got a good stab off against me, it was never good enough to make me collapse completely, usually just enough to push me fully onto the defensive and make sure that I couldn't go for any more expansion. The moves Diplodocus High made here accomplished what no human could do. It got me to let my guard down just long enough to make that brutal stab. And it did so through cooperation, persuasion, and most importantly, imitation, convincing me it was human. I really wish we'd gotten to these games in the commentary series, because I think to see the AI in action over and over, and the way players reacted to the AI and adapted over time, paints a much clearer picture than I can give in a short video like this. Still, I really hope I've conveyed what happened in that tournament and just how impressed I am by the way this bot played. Diplodocus High, in particular, achieved all five of my keys, something I did not previously think any AI would be able to do. The two Diplodocus bots placed first and second in the tournament scoring, with myself trailing in third place. The paper meta released afterwards uses ELO as a calculation instead of tournament score, which places Diplodocus High in first, a human player in second, and Diplodocus Low in third place. Although the results are anonymized, I believe I'm in fifth place in this ranking. Whatever the case, it's clear these AIs had solid results. Has gunboat diplomacy been mastered then? Well, it's difficult to tell. The tournament was played with players of varied skill levels, and Diplomacy is one of those games that changes significantly based on what kind of opponents you have. A game with all high skill level players is much less likely to be won through making a giant stab than a game with players of varied skill levels, because a high level player shouldn't leave themselves open to that. Well, I say that, but then I consider myself to be a high-level player, and the AI got me to leave myself open to a giant stab, so maybe I'm speaking too soon. I'd love to see Diplodocus play six expert players in the future and put this to the test. Whether that happens or not, though, one thing is very clear to me. AI has come for diplomacy, and it has done remarkably well.